Welcome to Season 7 of the Charity Matters Podcast. I'm Heidi Johnson, nonprofit founder, lifelong helper, and your host. I've been interviewing modern-day heroes for over a decade with my blog, and I'm so excited to share these inspiring conversations on our podcast. Join me as we learn the challenges and stories of innovators, entrepreneurs, and modern-day heroes who set out to solve the problems of humanity. Have you ever heard of the phrase posse? I think when we think of a posse, we think of a small group of people. Today's guest, Debbie Beal, is the founder of the Posse Foundation, and she has taken that word and revolutionized not only what it means, but what it's doing to make the world better, one posse and one student at a time. Join us for an inspirational conversation about how one person can truly change the world. I am so excited today to welcome Debbie Beal to Charity Matters for Season 7 premiere. Welcome, Debbie. We're so happy you're here. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. (laughs) Really excited to learn so much about your incredible work. And um, let's just dive right in. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Posse Foundation does? Yeah, I'd I'd love to. And I I hope a lot of your listeners have heard of Posse. We, We started in the 1980s. Um, when a student who had dropped out of college said, I never would have dropped out if I had my posse with me. And we thought, well, that's a brilliant idea, right? Why not send a posse, you know, a team of kids together to college so they could back each other up. It's brilliant, right? The best ideas are that simple. Yeah. So we, 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 um, well, I'll t- I don't know. You, you could ask your question. <laughs> well, no, no, no. So, so your mission is to send posse. Right. So, right. The idea was that if you send people together in a team, they can not only back each other up when times get rough, but they can begin to form critical mass, right? 10 students in every class, you get 40 students on a campus. That's a model of integrated diversity right there. Um, and and also kind of a, a catalyst for positive change in a, in a community. So our goal, what Posse is, is we are a national college success and leadership development program. And the ultimate big, you know, carrot at the end is that we're building a leadership network for the United States that more accurately reflects the real diversity of the American population. And and why are we doing that is, you know, you look at the United States Senate, it's almost 90% white, it's only 25% women. Or you look at the Fortune 500 CEOs or the Section 16 executives or college presidents, almost any industry in any field is, it's very homogeneous when you look at who's leading. So Posse is trying to, to contribute to a more diverse leadership. It's, it's so um, amazing what you do, but so where were you and what was that light bulb moment? Because a lot of people have great ideas and think, oh, wow, you know, okay. Yeah. The student said this to me, but they don't act on it. Mm -hmm. They don't do anything. There's something that happened. There's a path, there's a journey. There's a couple of boxes that there are dominoes that fall that say, I am going to change this or I can do that. So what what was that? Yeah. And you know, you're right. There's lots of ideas, but when I guess when you have the opportunity to invest in a really good idea and you don't take it, it's your miss. Right. It's True. the world's miss. True. And so this idea was not my idea, right? It comes from a student who said this. I never would have dropped out if I had my posse, but being in the right place at the right time, I was 23 years old. Wow. I was only out of college for, you know, just a short amount of time. And here I am with this big idea. It wasn't my idea, but here I am, you know, executing. Helping bring, yeah, helping to bring it to life. And Vanderbilt University was the first university to take a chance. You know, how do you get somebody to say, well, we'll try that. 
when you have no track record. That's not that easy. And luckily, there were people at Vanderbilt who saw that this could be a really valuable thing for their institution, right? In, in the 1980s, Vanderbilt was very white, very Southern, very wealthy. You know, all the, the women wore dresses to the football games. And, you know, how are they going to get kids from the Bronx to want to go there and stay there? Right. So they right. tried, they tried it. Wow. That's, I mean, that's to me. So talk to me because, you know, I've been interviewing nonprofit founders for a long time. And as I said to you before we jumped on, we are a unique, a unique breed. But at the end of the day, we're entrepreneurs. You know, we're now they're calling us all sorts of different things, social impact, social warriors, all these different social entrepreneurs. But we're entrepreneurs. We have an idea or we hear an idea or we want to work on an idea and we decide to roll up our sleeves and do it. So you're 23 years old. At 23, you're just navigating doing your own laundry and figuring out your bills and figuring out how you're going to do anything, let alone starting a business that relies on the kindness of others, which is a really challenging right. business model, as we all know. Mm -hmm. So what were the challenges as you're as you're starting to to do this? What because you are building an enormous community network, you're changing the way people think. You're so far ahead of the curve. It's such a great question and and such a great perspective that only you would have, right? You know, it's you understand it's I think people um devalue the work that goes into creating a nonprofit um that's trying to do good in the world. Correct. Right. For some reason, we don't see it as um an enterprise that that you would invest in the way you would invest in a in a you know for-profit business but it is <laughs> and it is to do everything well if you want it to succeed and that includes building a board of people who are experts and and building a network of donors and building an infrastructure that makes sense what i always say to other people who are starting a nonprofit is know your non-negotiables Right. Oh. And if you can stand behind your mission and right. not compromise, understand where you draw the line, what are your non negotiables, then you're much more likely to succeed. And so, and I, I, I honestly think that's about integrity also. You know, if you, if you just follow the money or if you, you, you know, you're, you're not strong in front of people who have big opinions about what you're doing, right. then you end up diluting the work. And we're not, none of us do this. No one, at least I have yet to meet someone, maybe they exist, but I have yet to meet a nonprofit founder that got into this to make money. To my knowledge, <laughs> right. there is not yeah. one that exists. That's just not our, our, what motivates us. It's not what makes us get up in the morning. And and like you said, the work that we do, we're not trying to manufacture something. We have the backs of humans on us at night that we don't sleep because we think someone doesn't go to college, someone isn't gonna get fed, someone isn't gonna get educated, someone isn't gonna have health care. Whatever it is that our organization does, that's that's a huge that humanity that we carry with us is a unique thing that most entrepreneurs do not carry. Right. And, and don't you feel that it's it's worth it, that there's value in that equal to being paid? So I often hear um, people who are in corporate for their whole careers wish that they could come and volunteer or do something with Posse because they're missing that piece of their lives. You right. know, they don't have that. Right. Well, and to your point, if we were CEOs, which we are, if we were CEOs of a business, the way we'd be paid is significantly different with the way that we are paid. We, you and I could, are CEOs, and we could go into corporate America and be a CEO because we've already been doing it. And it's, we've been doing it with a harder business model, actually. Um, we could probably, you know, open a can of whoop ass or two if we were if we were CEOs. But, but, but we're executive directors, which is somehow... Yeah, or presidents, founders, whatever. It it doesn't in the world equate the same. And and we're making the world better, right? Or we're trying really hard. Don't you love, don't you love what you do? 
I oh every day yeah me absolutely too. Too. how can how can you how not could you not? How can you not? You you can't do this work. You cannot do this work if you don't love it. You just can't. So speaking of that, what fuels you? Because, you know, we all have really busy lives. We wear a lot of hats in these jobs with meeting with funders and donors and building community and connection and the programs that we run. And and the list goes on and on. But we still have hard days like everybody else. We still have laundry. We still have life (laughs) We still have stuff we got to deal with. We still have the holidays and and we get you know, events and things we're doing. And it can be kind of overwhelming sometimes. There are days it can be because of that humanity, I think, and that responsibility. It can feel particularly over- overwhelming versus kind of a regular job. What, what fuels you to keep going in those moments? Yeah, you know, every day that I walk into the office, I walk past a row of posters that are just our graduates the day they graduate. They're in their caps and gowns. It's portraits one after the other, and they're smiling and they're the most beautiful photographs that I've ever seen. And it makes me so happy every day that I walk past those photographs and I know all their names, right? It's Robert and Gia and, you know, I, I, I'm now I'm not telling you all their names, but it's Robert. Well, and there's 12,000 of them. So Veronica, <laughs> and, and, and it's one after the other. And I feel like, okay, this is why we have posse, right? Maybe. You know, I, they, they're becoming doctors and CEOs. They're running for office. They're in, in government. They're, they're starting their own nonprofits. You know, we've got now since 1989, we've sent over 12,000 thousand students to college and they have won what is astounding to me they have won two billion dollars in scholarships from our partner schools they graduate at rates of 90 percent, and then as i'm trying to like convey to the world they go on to be the leaders that we so need and and what makes them different as leaders is that they are thinking about equity and inclusion in a way that we sometimes miss in the boardroom or in the rooms where decisions are being made. And we have a very polarized society right now where all we do is fight. We can't agree. We're attacking each other. Mm -hmm. And how valuable is it to have someone walk into the room who knows how to have conversations that are productive, who knows how to build community? We don't don't have that. And we're trying to do that. So I feel like that motivates me. When I was 23, I was not motivated by much more than, you know, figuring out how I could keep a job and pay my rent. And today I'm much more aware of the impact that a program like this can make on our society and on our world. And that motivates me now. Well, and so talk to me about impact. I, I obviously there's fantastic statistics and the graduation, the graduation rate and the amount of leaders you're putting in there. But impact to me is a double-edged sword. It's a word that I love and hate because we do have to give these statistics. We do have to tell our donors. We do have to have a, you know, an ROI, return on investment. People want to invest on a winning horse and, and bet on the right organization. And, and that's all good and fine. It's impossible to measure that leadership. I run a youth leadership organization as my day job. Measuring leadership is impossible. The nonprofit that I run is a youth leadership organization. Um, Measuring a life that's changed that comes from poverty or is an underserved community and goes on to become a doctor and change the trajectory of his life, his family's life, and every the ripple effect of that one person on that wall, it's impossible to measure that. So talk to me about impact besides the numbers um, and it just that greater context, because you really are, you're, you're changing the world. You're changing the way people view different communities. And, and, and the impact of that is, is just almost mind blowing. You know, it's, I know what you're saying when you say it's impossible to measure impact when you're talking about developing leaders. And yet we have to, we have to try to convey what the impact is because you're investing in a program where the return on your investment is not more money, right? Right. It's it's creating opportunity for people. It's making the world better. I tell this story and I always tell the same story because it's, it's an important origin story. 
And it, but it gives you this sense of, oh, there's the impact. And it's a story of somebody who was in the very first posse that we ever had, right? Recruited in 1989. Wow. And her name is Shirley. And she was this Dominican kid from Brooklyn. Her dad drove a yellow taxi. You know, she, she was going to be the first person in her family to go to college. And she goes to Vanderbilt University. She graduates with honors. She gets her doctorate in clinical psychology from Duke University. Wow. She becomes the dean of the college at Middlebury. And oh, my God. She becomes the president of Ithaca College, the first Dominican-American to be president of a four-year college in the entire United States. Wow. Yes. I have chills wow. everywhere. Yes. Wow. She's amazing and she's gone on to do more amazing things. But I, I tell that story because it captures the idea of impact, right? Here you find a student Perfectly. who maybe never would have thought of going to Vanderbilt, right. maybe never would have shown up on their radar screen. And yet she goes and now she's a first or she's changing the world or she's sharing right. her ideas. She's building something that's making our, our world better for all of us. And it's that term you use, the ripple effect. One person. Yep. Right. And, and now her impact on all the students at her college right. and her empathy and her understanding and her, her experience. Right. And not to, inter to that. interrupt you, but, but her mother in our video says, um, Cheryl, when Shirley became president of Ithaca college, her mother who was there, right. Seeing her daughter become president of this college said, a, a girl walked up to me and said, I want to be like Shirley. Oh. She said, I cried. I felt like I had a million dollars on my hands. Oh, even but more, that's even better, right? Beautiful. right? That's it's what you're saying. It's right. this woman who now is a model for so many young for people. For so many others. Well, I was um saying to you for a very long time, I was very, super involved with um, a Crystal Ray school here in Los Angeles yes. called called Bourbon Day, where our boys um all live um, are very underserved communities, and we have a hundred percent success rate that they go to a four-year college. And so we, um, and I, I think I rolled off that board maybe like four or five years ago. But we would we had the challenge, and I didn't know about Posse, even though you existed. We had the challenge because our boys were coming from Watts in South Central Los Angeles, and they were not staying in school. Mm -hmm. because they weren't being sent in posses. And we ultimately um, kind of bat worked around, but we worked with our rec college recruiters and we're saying, can you take a group of them so that they have mentors when they get there or take some more from this class so that you have some mentorship and leadership and um, so we can keep them there. And, and we really struggled with watching these boys who had worked so hard and their families had worked so hard for them to get to this short-term finish line in the scheme of life, but felt like an impossible line. And then to get there and say, oh my gosh, now I'm failing my family because I don't think I can do this. I'm so lonely. I'm so isolated. I don't have anyone to help me through this. And now, and now what am I going to let everybody down? Everyone's, I'm the example. And so I think about Shirley and I think about all those kids that try, they they think they've got there, they have the brass ring, and then they just can't hold on because they don't know what to do. Right. And how much and pressure? So much pressure. And these kids already have enough pressure right now. It's so different than when we were growing up. It's 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 unbelievable the pressure that they put on themselves too, right? Because I don't think we put that, at least I didn't put that pressure on myself, but these kids put a lot of pressure on themselves. You think about, you know, the pressure that that your family or your their sense of what you should be doing, that that's a kind of pressure that we do put on ourselves. And then you think about what's it's compounded by the issues right. that young people face today that that I didn't face when I was growing up. I'm 58 years old now. And so, you know, I think about um, obviously politics, but look at AI and look at social media and you think right. about what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening on campuses and racism. You know, we've been <laughs> facing a court system that's been rolling back civil rights and women's rights and rights for LGBTQ populations and rights for vo you know, voting rights. And 
you know, whatever your view is on that, these young people are looking at a world and wondering what their role will be in it. Right. When they, right. When and they have so much more information than we had. And so it's, it's, it's not always a blessing to have that much hard. information. It's hard. We had to go to the library and dig it up. Yeah, and card check, catalogs. Do we decimal system and all sorts of stuff that these kids are like, yeah. let me get asking their phone. Hey, who is the, you know, who did this? What year did this happen? It's such a different, it's such a different world. But I do think that they have more pressure than we had. Mm-hmm. So Obviously, you are a dreamer because you can't be an entrepreneur and you can't be a nonprofit founder because every year we push, we talk about pressure, we push ourselves, our dream gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we start out helping one and then it's two and then it's 100 and then it's 12,000 and then it's right. And here we are. Right. And, 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 but it's a beautiful, it's a blessing and a curse um, for us, but it's, it's a beautiful thing that we end up doing. So, What's the big dream? Because hmm. keep pushing the envelope, Debbie, and and it's pretty incredible what you have done. It's it's beyond remarkable. So what's the dream now? Like what well, where do you want to see it go? You know, we're already a national program. We operate out of 10 brick and mortar cities, you know, New Orleans, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, big cities. Um, right. we expanded. I I'll I'll tell you a, a, just a short story. Um, when in 2020, when the pandemic hit and we all went home, we were worried. Hasi's all about relationships and team and program. And that's with right. all in person. How are we going to do this? And our staff, who they're amazing, they turned the program into a program that we could deliver on Zoom, right? So now we had a virtual Posse program. And I, I woke up one morning and I thought, oh my God. We just interviewed 17,000 students on Zoom. And I thought, wait a minute, (laughs) we could expand our reach. If we can do this on Zoom. (laughs) Of course you did. (laughs) Right? We can now open in cities that we've never been able to be in before. And so I called Arnie Duncan, right, the former Secretary of Education under Obama. And Alberto Carvalho, who is the superintendent of Miami-Dade Public Schools. And the three of us hosted a meeting for the superintendents of cities that we had never touched. Dallas, Philly, Cleveland, Memphis, the cities that came. And overnight, the Posse Foundation more than doubled the number of cities from which we now recruit students. Wow. Fantastic. And we've now, we have 92 partnerships all taking, you know, 10 students a year, which means 920 new students a year. We're going to get to a thousand. And, and for, if you really want to know my dream, my dream is that one day I can create a fund, like a half a billion dollar fund, which I think is doable. I really do. It that is. Generate enough money so that I could g- provide grants to 100 college and university partners every year. And that would guarantee in perpetuity these spots for Posse Scholars. We're calling it the Century of Leaders Fund, and I'll tell you why it's called that. It's called that because if every year we had 1,000 students and every decade 10,000 Posse Scholars, that's 100 thousand leaders for America over the course of a century. And you and I know that 10 years in a career is just a blink of an eye. Yep. Yep. So this fund would guarantee that it's different than having someone, you know, donate a billion dollars to their alma mater. This would be supporting a hundred of our best colleges and universities in the United States. That's what I want to do before I leave. I think I can do it. I hope I, I think you can. I um I've been really involved with TCU and was on their chancellor's board for a decade and just rolled off. And um, five years ago, the dean of advancement, um, a great man named John Whelan, said, "What Heidi? What do you think if I, if I raise a billion dollars?" Yes. I said a billion dollars <laughs> like five years ago. I go, Are "You a billion dollars? What a billion dollars? Like we have ten thousand kids at TCU. We're a tiny little college. What a billion dollars?" 
Well, we just had the 150th anniversary in November, and we announced that we raised a billion dollars. We did it. Fantastic. We did it. Right? We like, did it. It's about believing. and it's It about, is. Um, it it's about, is. Yes. And dreaming big and, and yes. having a vision. And he aligned it with this 150th anniversary of the school, and he said, I think I can do it by then. I think I can do it by then. And 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 he did, and we did, I mean, and it happened. For right? those people who believed in that vision, right? And right. invested in it's all of right, this. There's this theme in our conversation about investing, right? And and having a vision. And and you know, for leaders, I mean, I teach leaders, about four thousand leaders a year, high school, college teaching high high school, high school teaching, middle school students. Um, and our whole thing is about a real leader has a vision has a goal, has a dream. It all starts with that. And obviously you're a leader, Debbie. That's, there's no question about that. But, but that's what, that's what propels us because we all want, like Harry met Sally, we want what she's having. We're like, (laughs) oh, I want that. I want what she's having. I want that. (laughs) Whatever that is, I want a little bit of that. Because it's, people want to, to be part of something like that and something bigger than themselves and something beautiful like the work you do, which is remarkable, which is really remarkable. So talk to me about um, some of the lessons you've learned along the way. I mean, you've grown up with Posse. I mean, it's amazing to think that the kids that are graduating are the age you were when you started. Like, yeah, that's yeah. it's crazy. So they do look to- younger and younger to me every year. <laughs> you and I are the same age. Okay. So- <laughs> you look great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. So talk to me about some of the lessons that you've learned on this remarkable journey, because you've really gotten to see some of the best of humanity yeah. and witness incredible things. So what have you learned in this time? Um, I've learned that when something seems like a crisis that's going to end the whole thing, it's it's not. Right. That you can get through almost anything and that the best thing you can do when there's some big problem is sleep on it. Nothing. Yeah. Right. I think you always have a better perspective in the morning. The obstacle is the way. Yeah. Right. I think that also um, you need to be able to say no. And this connects to that other idea of knowing where your non-negotiables are. Right. Sometimes it's really hard to say no. And when you're young or you're starting a new thing or you're new in your job or you're you just got your promotion, how do you say no? And and what I always tell my my team is sometimes you need to find a way to say no by saying yes to something else. Right. I like and that. You can almost always find something else that you can say yes to. Right. Right. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Well, and I think that it's, it's, I think also when you are so young and um, you want to please people when you're young, you, 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 you don't want to get fired. Right. You, you want to make sure everybody's happy. Like just, and in this role, being a pleaser isn't really always, yes, you want your team to be together. You want to be rowing the same direction. You want your donors to be happy and your board to be happy. And you want the people that you serve to be happy. But it isn't really about pleasing. It's it's about coming together for something bigger. And there's a difference. So I think that that's I agree, really... I agree with that. Coming together for something bigger and being able to articulate it. You know, right. this we have um, an idea that that's very unique to Posse, right? We are the only merit-based program in the United States that's addressing these issues of equity and, right. and equality and inclusion and diversity. Unfortunately, we have somehow equated diversity with deficit. You know, that we we must be compromising our standards or lowering our standards if we let students in through a diversity initiative. You know, we've created um, offices on campus to focus on institutional diversity, and then we segregate out all the students who are people of color and put them in those offices. And and even though programs for at-risk and poor and minority and needy and underprivileged and underserved, these are very, very important programs. If that's the only way that we address issues of diversity, we do a disservice to ourselves, to our country, to our society, because we equate deficit then with people of color. 
So Posse said, no, 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 no. Let's create a merit-based program where people win these awards on their merits. We don't screen for race and we don't screen for need. These are outstanding young people who have earned their way into this program. And we address these issues. Right. That's well, and everything, I mean, you always want to get people to rise. It's all, it's, you, you always want to build up, you know, I mean, we didn't go to school to come home with Fs. We came, went to school and parents like, is that the best you can do? (laughs) You know, I mean, you want to inspire everyone to do their best and everything. So I love that you guys are doing that in merit-based. So how do you think you've changed during this time? I mean, you've grown up with this organization that you've created. You mean me personally or? or You personally, you personally. Uh, you know, that's such a, we ask questions like that all the time of our, our students and, you know, I am, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be more like you. If I feel passionately Don't about do it, it. <laughs> honestly, I'm trying to be more mellow, right? You know, I think it takes a lot of skill and understanding not to be reactive, and not to be, um, not to try to push my views or my opinions on somebody else. I think I've changed. I think I'm working on it. Okay. It's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> we are all a work in progress. I we're all, we're all, we're, yeah. But I that's the saying, biggest thing. Yeah. Well, we're all here to learn, right? We're here for a short amount of time and we're here to learn and we're here to get whatever lessons we're supposed to be getting and and hopefully teach them to somebody else. And mm-hmm. and sometimes those lessons are easy and sometimes they're really freaking hard. Sometimes those lessons are not great lessons, but I think that that's a really great lesson. What it's do just, you think's the biggest change in you since you Oh, started? look at you turning No, I just am curious. You know, um I I think I have become um more empathetic and I think I've I think I've become a lot more empathetic over the years. And I think that I, these conversations like the one we're having, I'm, I selfishly, it's my guilty pleasure, but I get to have them every week. And, and now I get to share them, which is so great. But I, I learned so much from people who give up their lives to serve others. There is such richness in the wisdom from people who live a life of service. And, uh, and I can't, I feel so privileged. It makes me want to cry. And so I have such enormous gratitude. Um, I have enormous gratitude for the privilege of having these conversations, the privilege to share these conversations, and then the wisdom that I learn from these conversations. Um, It is literally like just the gift I give myself every week. And I hope that I give everybody else because it really is a gift. I actually don't think our answers are so far apart. No, I don't. I think. I think you're right. I think you're yeah, right. This idea of being more understanding and being more em- empathetic. I love you. I love your answer. Actually, you well, know, we, I, I love yours. We we started a uh, program in honor of Jeff Ubbin, who was our board chair for ten years, and and he and his dad Tim Ubbin, like together, the two of them gave you know thirty million dollars, fifty million dollars to the organization. Actually, and and. We named a program after him. And we take, even though we have thousands of policy scholars, every year we pick just five. These are sophomores who have a 3.7 GPA or higher, and they're just amazing kids all around. And we match them with the CEO in the industry of their interest. So imagine you're a sophomore, you've got great grades, and you're really wow. engaged. We give you also a $10,000 no strings attached. And we say, okay, go spend four weeks with this CEO and learn everything you can about leadership and let them teach you, mentor you. And and that way you can understand what it might be like to be in their shoes one day, right? And you're a model for other posse scholars who can see that's possible. And to the CEO, we say, look, you're not just making this an entry level initiative, right? Right. You're also doing it in your own office. So who's done this? Satya Nadella at Microsoft, Ken Frazier at Merck, the CEOs of Eli Lilly, Pfizer, Moderna, Metropolitan Museum of Art, 
Congressman John Lewis. We have senators, the governor of California. It's an amazing wow. list. And what I love about it is it's 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 showing these young people that people who have just made it in life, right? They're at the they're right. at the top of their careers. Believe in them. Right. Right. And and so much so that they invest time to say, come, come spend time with me. And don't you think that when someone believes in you, then you believe in yourself? I mean, that's the magic. That's the secret sauce of leadership. And and we do it at um, Task, the organization that I run, with our college kids, with our high school kids. It's not a CEO, but a college kid telling a high school kid and a high school kid telling a middle school, middle school student, you're amazing. You're brilliant. You're so interesting. You're so funny. You're so smart. Whatever it is. And all of a sudden, they believe it themselves. And that shift that you see, let alone the mentorship I mean, obviously, having a CEO from a Fortune 500 country is, uh, company is incredible. But but any time we take the time to tell someone we believe in them, we will shift them forever. Okay, so because it reminds me of a story. Please that, share. That I like to tell. And it's about believing in people. It's about allyship. It's about that making a difference. Um, but a, a number of years ago, I was in a room with the CEO of Deloitte. And her name, it was a woman, her name at the time, well, it was still her name, her name is Kathy <laughs> Engelbert. And she was speaking to 50 Posse alumni, just about her life and her career. And one Posse scholar raised her hand and she said, well, you're a woman and you're a CEO. How did, how did you do it? How did that happen? And Kathy said, well, I'm going to tell you how. There's, you need to know three things. One, you need to work really hard. Two, you need to find great mentors. And three, there needs to be someone who will pound the table for you. And let me tell you what I mean by that, she said. I worked hard and I had great mentors. But there was this one executive who, when the door was closed, would say to his colleagues, have you thought about Kathy Engelbert? You know, Kathy's pretty amazing. Kathy's great. Kathy's outstanding. Kathy, 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 Kathy. And Kathy became the CEO of Deloitte, not because of that person, but in part right. because of that person. Right. And I, I say that story because of what you just said, Heidi, right? That we have all had, whether we realize it or not, someone who's pounded the table for us. Right. But more important is we can pound the table for someone else. And Amen. that's what you do. And that's what I do. And if we all did that, even just for one person. That's right. And I think that the people look to people like you, people like Kathy, people like me, and say, I don't know how to make a difference. And you just told everybody exactly how to do it exactly. in three simple steps. Or Kathy did. But that's exactly how you do it. Just one kindness, one belief in another person, lifting one person up. That's all it takes. It's just, at the end of the day, it is that simple. Right. It is that simple. Thank you so much. Tell us where we can support you, donate, get involved, Aww, nominate so people, <laughs> all, the, like, all the great things, Posse Foundation. Tell us how we can be a part of this incredible organization. Well, we have a great website possefoundation.org, right? We spell it P-O-S-S-E, foundation.org. And you can donate there, right? Or you can send a check to the Posse Foundation okay. at 14 Wall Street. But um, you can also volunteer. You can help us interview students. You can volunteer to be a career coach. You can be on, become a member of one of our boards. You know, obviously we need funding. We, we have to raise $35 million a year. And it's amazing because it supports thousands of students um, and it helps us leverage the, the scholarship dollars that we get from the universities. In fact, for every dollar that someone donates to Posse, we leverage five times that amount in scholarships from our university partners. It's a good ROI, Debbie. It's a good ROI. There you go. <laughs> so that's how, thanks for asking that. I appreciate it. Uh, well, we all, everyone listening, I'm sure wants to go and follow you on social media and 
go to your website and learn about this. And I hope that these conversations really um, just make people think and empower them and make them realize that they have the tools to make a difference in their world. And it does is it can be as big as posse or it can be as small as being kind and telling someone you believe in them. But either way, it's hugely significant. And thank you, Debbie, for making the world so much better. I'm just so grateful for you in this conversation. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed it. Oh, I appreciate you so much. And I'm so grateful to you that you invited me to come hang out with you. And next time I'm hanging out with you in Los Angeles. Hey, that I can't wait. I can't wait. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Charity Matters Podcast. I truly enjoyed talking to Debbie about what it takes to start a business that really changes people's lives. I think her comment about learning to say no by saying yes to other things was absolutely brilliant. To learn more about modern day heroes like Debbie, or if you'd like to reach out to us, visit us at charity-matters.com. Or connect with us on Instagram at Charity Matters. If you enjoyed our conversation, we would love it if you shared it with your family and friends. And please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. But more than that, thank you for caring, for believing in goodness, and for being a part of our movement. You're exactly what the world needs more of. Remember that together, we can make a difference one small act of kindness at a time. Charity matters.